On today's episode, I catch up with a guy who's revolutionising rugby skills. Hi everyone, welcome to the Starting From Scratch podcast. Today's episode, I'm catching up with local rugby coach and entrepreneur, Ane Matawia. Uh, and it's a pleasure to have him on board and get to know you a little bit better today, mate, and just hear a bit of your story, I guess, in terms of where you've come from, um, you know, growing up in Samoa and then moving to Australia, um, getting married, that sort of journey. So I guess what I want to touch on today and the the context behind the podcast is just to have a chat to you about the journey that you've been on and some of the highs, some of the lows, some of those challenges you've sort of, you've come across along the way, and then some of the stuff you're doing now with the Rugby Skills Academy and, and I guess developing young athletes and, and the journey that you're trying to place them on as well. So thanks for coming along. It's, uh, it's good to have you, mate. Yeah, no, thanks, Shane. No, thank you for having me. And uh, we're now really looking forward to it. I think it's a great concept what you have here today. So Cheers, mate. No, it'll be good. So I guess growing up in Samoa, um, life's a lot different to, to Australia. And um, so do, can you, you just yeah. sort of spend a couple of minutes taking us through what your childhood was like? And um, it was good actually. Well, from my own from my own experience as a as a, an island kid growing up back home, it's you know it's for us it's normal. Um, you know, growing up home, you always think of you know how to sort of way of how to make a living. I guess in terms of either school or, or rugby. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, a kid that grew up there, you know, uh, sort of, uh, we don't get, you know, the opportunities don't come our way a lot. Uh, and I think um, looking at having, you know, even speaking personally, my own son today, he gets dropped off to school, he gets picked up, he gets everything, you know, bought for him. Um, where I, you know, I grew up back then, it's, you know, um, a typical day for us as a 14 or 13 year old boy back in Samoa, it's, you know, you get up fairly early in the morning, probably six o'clock, you either feed the, feed the chickens, feed the pigs, and then cook breakfast, and then just have a shower and catch two buses to go to school. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, after that, you get your footy trainings, come back home again, same thing again, you've got to feed the pigs, feed the chickens, make the, you know, cook food, and then off to footy trainings. So, you know, we probably run or or walk to you know three k three k kilometers for footy trainings, yeah. and um, that's sort of a typical day for us. But you know, for us back then, it's it's what we know, and you know, it was good. Yeah. So, I guess in terms of you know looking now at the at the, the life that you've created for yourself, mm. what was was there a turning point um, in terms of well, the mindset? Because I think growing up, I guess my perception and, and based on what you've just said as well, that that growing up in some other the opportunities don't come you know, as quickly as they might or as yeah. easily as they do in Australia. So mm. what, what was it that, I guess, made you, you know, what, was there a light bulb moment? Did your parents sort of push yeah. you in that direction? Um, I think uh, it was quite a funny thing when going back, I've always have these things of setting goals for myself. So the first thing for me is, and it's, it's an honesty um, goal that I set in myself, I will always want to marry an overseas lady. Yep. So it's one thing for me to say, that's my ticket out of Samoa. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, it, you know it, it just the way it was, you know. Um, and then I thought, okay, if I can get that, if I can work on that, then the second part for me is I know that footy, it's sort of another way of me making a living. I said, yeah. set my goal, I wanted to play the highest level overseas. You know, find myself a good lady and hopefully they can appreciate, you know, me or take me. And that was it. And then I start working on how do I get there? Yep. Um, like I said, the mindset, you know, and, and, and I guess that was the only way for me just to get me going in that terms of get my mindset, achieve little things that I wanted to, that I wanted to achieve to, to get a bigger, bigger prize, I guess. Yeah. So which in the journey came first, the rugby or the woman? The rugby came first, oh. obviously. Um, the rugby came first and I thought, if I can prioritise my stuff, you know, what I needed to do, no doubt the other part will follow. Yeah. Um, and that's what I did. I sat back and I said, I wanted to make into that as a young boy, I always watched the likes of Michael Jones and those sort of guys like that. Um, and I said, I wanted to play, you know, for the World Cup um, in years later. So 
for me, it was like I wanted to achieve, you know, my steps heading up there. Yeah. So, you know, the trains and everything, it was, but right from the, the set go, it was already on my mind that I'll, I will make a living out of rugby yeah. and I will move overseas. Because is there any other sport in rugby, uh, sorry, other than rugby in Samoa that's sort of focused on or is it it's it's 80 percent rugby and there's, there's a few others yes i think Samoa. it's we are the only few countries in the world that rugby it's the number one sport yeah. so it's therefore a bit like india and cricket pretty much yeah. yes so i think uh, we're the only the country that yes everyone plays rugby whether you go to sunday school school or church or anything yep. you'll end up playing rugby somehow anyway yeah. so um whether it's backyard yep. or on the beach or, at 40 field. or not. yes <laughs> whether you want it or not so it was become you know the 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 culture for us yep. that that's a way you've got to make a living and and everyone sort of encouraged that so then how do you set yourself apart because i'm assuming then if, if as a as a teenage boy growing up in some old schools and 80% of them are playing rugby. How do you set yourself apart from, or how did you set yourself apart from the rest of the group to be able to go on and achieve what you've achieved? I think it's the fact that was recognised by not only overseas coaches, but our national coaches. Yep. So um, it was, you know, making to the, you know, the, the rep level 40, you know, sort of the schoolboys rugby. Um, you know, captain those schoolboys rugby and then move on to the Colts. So play for the, the Samoan under 21s back in, in those days. Yep. Um, and I guess then it's really sort of uh, giving me that, that sort of the understanding that this is, this is it. I, you know, there's no other way but rugby and I can, you know, and the, the encouragement and the, the recognition from the coaches mm -hmm. that sort of really can see myself, it's, there's no other way here yep. but to go, go yeah, full on. So you had an opportunity, we spoke a little bit before off camera about you had an opportunity to, to come to school in Australia for a short mm. period of time. Did, was that, uh, I guess, a, a different experience to what you what you were going through in Samara at the time? Uh, it was actually because, you know, that was perhaps it was the first time and, you know, for me it's going up into the big world and, you know, in Sydney out of all the places, mm. you know, um, it's a, as a 16 year old boy, you know, 17, going up, uh, 17, living in Sydney by myself and my teammate, it was a, you know, it was a big, big eye opener for us. But I guess it all sort of related and somehow, if it wasn't for that, getting out of my comfort zone, um, I wouldn't be where I am now because you really sort of understand what is right and what is wrong and how to drive yourself, you know, um, you know, mentally and, mm. you know, and physically, I guess, yeah. So when you finish school, um, you know, obviously rugby is your primary focus in terms of how yep. you're going to live the rest of your life. So yep. what, what was the, I guess, the jump from out of school and into, into playing rugby at a professional level? Um, it, was, uh, it was a straight sort of, you know, transitions was sort of, uh, even though it was a schoolboy jumping straight to the, the national teams. And, yep. I, and I think, um, you know, it, was a, it wasn't so, it wasn't hard for us because we knew that we were sort of, this is where I wanted to go, me personally. Yep. So when I got there, and I thought, well, this is it. I've got to get, full, you know, I've got to get, you know, full full steam on. But you know, it was good. I think it was '94 when I was got selected uh, to to away in you know in England and and um, and Scotland. Yep. And I think I've just finished high school uh, then. So um, I was taking all my, I was sitting my school C's at the moment. So I was taking all my school books with me <laughs> to tours. But the study was another story. <laughs> yeah. So I yeah. guess that's, that, that strikes a challenge for me because I, probably from an environmental perspective, playing rugby in Samoa is not going to get you know, close to zero degrees too often. Yeah. So going and touring England and Scotland and playing in different weather conditions, was yeah. that something that you guys found challenging? And did, you have, did, the, did the coaching staff put you through different things to get you used to that? Or was it just a shock to the system and you had to deal with it? Uh, it was pretty much sort of, uh, you know, shock to the systems. You know, you, you play a lot of full in New Zealand, you know, and it, you know, yeah. in, in Auckland it's cold. But yeah. when you travel this part of the, you know, up in England and Europe, and especially towards, you know, you're talking about their winter time. Yeah. So you're talking about October, November. So yeah. um, I can remember uh, clearly we had a game up in Newcastle that we have to stop, uh, delay the kickoff. So 
the groundsman can just sort of uh, blow away the snow that was on the <laughs> side. So, so it's that sort of, you know, like back to you say, it's one, you know, just from warm to the extreme. Yeah. So, you know, it was, it was eye opening, it was good. But you know, it was an experience that you know will always stay you know with with my you know with me. Mm. Um, any setbacks, I guess, to this point? Like, you, were you injury prone, or did you have to you know had you had pretty good luck through that point? Um, uh, there were a few setbacks, uh, you know, as 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 a part of the package as well. Um, you know, suffer a lot of injuries. Yeah. Um, uh, in, in in knees, I think I had about five operations on my knees. Wow. And the part of that because I. When I represent Samoa in the World Cup in '99, I play as a hooker. So obviously, I have to put on a bit of put of weight. And yep. I think back on those days, my playing weight at the time it was probably 95 kilos. So and then I have to go back into the sevens, uh, seven sites around the you know the IRP sevens around the world. Yep. Where I have to drop the weight even lesser. So you know, so the the demand on my body was it was fairly big back yep. then. Um, Recovery wasn't so much sort of awareness for us as yep. what they have these days, but you know I guess it's it is what it is. But you know that's 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 what it was. It's you know the impact on the the injuries. I think that was the only sort of uh, sort of a setback. But you know it's it's all part of the the package, I guess. And were there coaching and mentoring staff around you back then? Like was the setup? Because it seems like the the pathway was very well established by Samoan rugby to, to understand that, you know, how to get kids out of that school system and into yep. playing um, you know, rugby at a World Cup. For yeah. Example. Well, the pathway was great. Like, you know, we pretty much know exactly where we wanted to be. Yep. And obviously, you know, you, you tick the boxes, that, you know, the few boxes in the middle to how to get to the, mm. to the, to the top. But like you say, the, the mental sort of uh, mentoring of us players, that's where I guess um, our parents come in that a lot. Um, there was not much of the from the, the TV environment itself. It was just um, you know the moms and dads. You know, just make sure that we'd be very respectful. You know, those sort of things, and you know, just to do things like to make sure that we beha- obviously behave well when you go, you know, outing and those sort of things. You yeah. know, in the public. So. I think the parents have played a big part on that mm. um, back in the days. For that's, us. that's pretty interesting because I know I find a lot with sport in Australia is that parents sometimes tend to treat um, some sports as a bit of a child mining activity. They're not really well involved. Yep. Some parents do get involved and in, in power to them. That's fantastic. Yep. So it's great to see, I think, that family involvement through that pathway, mm. which, which keeps the families engaged. And you can see, I think that sort of reinforces for me why you see some of the Polynesian nations and they're, they're, there's just so much commitment from them to, their, to following their team. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's because mum and dad can see us that our sort of you know, that's a way of us making a living out of it. So, yeah. um, you know, and they were the first one to say, you know, to, to us, you're only as good as your last game because they know, you know, if one of us, well, if I play up, you know, off the field, you know, um, not only I'll get dropped, you don't get your income, you know, and those sort mm-hmm. of things. So they're really looking up for our own welfare, I guess, in that part. And yeah. I think they see it as a, you know, a massive opportunity for us to, to, to earn. So I guess it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a fair call to them. Mm. Did you ever get dropped from a side and have to deal with the disappointment? Of- oh yes, easy, yeah, yeah massively. Um, I remember I was supposed to head overseas on a contract and then I got injured. Um, then someone took over my contract for me. Um, then I went back after that, I went back and recovery, you know, rehab gone back and then it wasn't the same. Me personally, I thought I was, yeah. but then the, 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 uh, the management and the others think, you know, it's not the same. So. Um, yeah, very, very disappointing, um, and I think that's probably the lowest part you can get, mm. you know, when you're getting a drop, um, and it's everything. So, luckily, once again, you know, uh, my my wife now, um, she was, you know, a, a girlfriend at the time, you know, she was pretty sort of the backbone because she knew that, you know, and her support, it's that was the most important for us. So, yeah, right. um, you know, she was, she can see where I was heading. I was heading in the wrong way, you know. Um, in terms of losing the plot and yep. become sort of, you know, being, being silly, yep. uh, you know, out and about. So, because there was no way for us to get that frustration out, you know, it's it's all that before you were in and now you're just on the outer. So it was good, it was good help. Yeah, that's great. 
So how, where, at what point was it becoming prevalent that, you know, obviously there's a World Cup looming in 1999 and, and you're in the national squad, you're sort of working in towards that. So what were the series of events that sort of led you into, you know, touring and playing in a World Cup? And mm. I think uh, it really comes back to, um, it go back to how we prepared ourselves. We, me personally, I start setting my goals uh, into to making the, the, the come back to the team again. Um, making into the, we call it back and then it's a Samoa A, which is your, almost like your B team. Yep. Um, and, and for me, it's, I have to make sure that I play well. Yeah. Um, and everything in trainings, um, there was a lot of extra trainings. Yep. So when, when some few of my mates were just, you know, heading off somewhere or sleeping in that morning, I'll be up in the field like, you know, six o'clock, just putting in the extras. Um, you're going to the gym. And I think that's where I will always remember like most of the other, my other, you know, next door neighbors and my mates, they see me just taking off in the morning and coming home um, and even coming late at, you know, at night at training. So it, those things nowadays, we can still think that does make a difference. Mm. Um, Absolutely. And, and it's great because it really sort of set me back when I got selected for the, for the team. It really made that, that difference because I know that I, I really did one of that and you know without the extras and my mindset yeah I wouldn't be there yeah mm. so what was that just take me through the experience of playing in a World Cup because I know the frenzy that, that that sort of comes around you know whenever it's World Cup time no matter mm. what sport it is cricket yeah. hockey rugby league rugby union yeah oh, it was massive it yeah. was massive um, you know it's it's the pinnacle of of any sports you know and of course with with rugby union it's it's a pinnacle of, of anyone, you know, World Cup in the world, you've got so many teams from all over the world, it's their top players yeah. now representing their country. And um, for us, it was, yes, the money was okay, but it, it was was more honoured to represent your country, the mm. jersey and, you know, and what's on the jersey. So um, the highlight of that, it's not only been part of that, but at the same time, you still strive to be the starting, to the starting player of that team. So. Um, it was just a, a massive for us to be part of that. And I think the highlight of that was, you know, beating Wales, you know, um, in Millennium Stadium. Uh, 72,000 people on that stadium. Yeah. Um, and we could hear a pin drop. <laughs> when uh, you could. <laughs> we could. Um, but we, I remember we stayed in Swansea. Yeah. Um, and I think it's about an hour and a half from that to Cardiff. Mm -hmm. So our trainer put on the, we deliberately take ourselves away just to isolate ourselves for yeah. that game. So and I remember on our way back to the Millennium Stadium on that morning, he put on the video on the bus, I think at the Rumble, Rumble in the Jungle. Yep. So it was good. It was appropriate for us to watch that. It yep. was just the underdogs versus the big dog. So, yep. you know, it was, we didn't need any more, more motivation apart yep. from that. That's interesting because I think obviously, well, probably obviously to most people is that Samoa wouldn't have went into a World Cup being a favourite or being, you know, expected to probably rank in the top, you know, finish yep. in the finals. So mm. how, do you, how, do you, how do you as a playing group have that belief mm. that you can still go there and, and yep. compete? Is that something that's natural to an athlete yep. or the coaching staff really just work hard to motivate you? And um, I, I think it's a combination of everything. I think the, the, the you know, the... The coaching staff and all your, you know, your, you know, your advisory group that within the touring group that you're trying to sort of, uh, you know, just to reinstall that to to us to their self belief. But I think for us, it's we always think it's it's what we can control, mm -hmm. and I think that's perhaps it's the biggest thing, not only for us for any sports. Um, we spoke about you know controlling, so we can only control the way we play, yeah. um, and things that we can't control that's out of our hands. So that was our belief, and and that was the biggest motivation for us. We can control the way we've been training well, the way we play, um, and and that was all it is. And yeah. it really did pay it off. Yeah, that's brilliant. Mm. So life after rugby. So in 2011, you and your wife moved to Australia. Yep. So what, what, I guess, in terms of, was there, a, what's happened in between? After, so life after rugby before you started Rugby Skills Academy, what, what, what have you done in that time? Um, life after rugby, obviously, uh, when we um, sort of retired, I, you know, I was uh, the police force in New Zealand. So I think I spent about, I joined the police force and I think I spent about seven to eight years there. Yep. Um, and it was, you know, it was one of the best jobs that I've ever, you know, dealt with. Challenging, yeah. But you know, um, 
it was you know it's the most uh, you know it's the most rewarding thing when you when you do you know uh, sort of a public servant. Um, after that, we moved back here, and then um, I you know I was working in the mine, you know constructions and uh, and that sort of uh, working. But at the end of the day, I still think that I still have something in sports that I wanted to, and mainly in rugby. Yeah. Um, and that's where, you know, um, sort of the uh, Rugby Skills Program, Rugby Skills Academy sort of, um, yeah, sort of started. Yep. Mm. And now you've turned that into, because did it start off as a part-time thing and you were just doing uh, it sort of on the side or did you commit no, to it? No, I, I completely committed to it. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, it was a big, it was a big jump. Mm. Yeah, scary, yeah. you know, financially. Yep. But it was, it, once again, it's, um, I'm one of those big believers that I can only have one shot at it. I just don't live if only I could, you know, I wish I could do it back then. Um, and that was it. I've always said to myself, if it doesn't work, then I think at least I did try yep. instead of sitting back and said, well, I was hoping that I had to go with it. Yep. So it, it obviously um, touch wood that it's going along, you know, um, in, a, in the right direction. But yeah, it was it was a massive, it was a massive jump. But mm. it's looking at back now, it's yeah, it's great. It's great support. So how many kids did you start with? I guess in the first year of Rugby Skills Academy, how many kids were you coaching? Um, the first the first year, I can remember, we only probably sixty kids. Yep. Yeah, sixty kids. So um, I can remember clearly my first session out of Voss Park up here. I was nervous. I'd never been so nervous because I thought these people have booked, these people have turned up and what am I going to do to their kids? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but, you know, it was only 10 of them, yep. but I was as nervous as hell. It's just like, Jesus, yeah, there's a preparing for the big game. Yep. Um, you know, and now after the first year and now, you know, we're looking at 500 plus kids, you know, three years later. So, yep. you know, it's, it's obviously we're doing something right. Yeah. And now, so obviously starting off in Rocky and you've had the ability to travel a little bit, so mm. now how much of Queensland are you, are you covering now with the, with the academy? Um, we pretty much covered pretty much all the way down from Brisbane yep. um, up to Toowoomba, um, you know, around the Central Highlands, uh, obviously within here in the CQ regions, uh, White Bay, Harvey Bay, um, heading up to Mackay. Uh, uh, Bredekin up in Townsville, yep. and next weekend I'll be up in Charterstown. Wow. So we're covering some some fair mileage. If the water's gone down, I think I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what I like about what you're doing is that um, you're not just focused, I guess, primarily on, like primarily your primary focus is developing better rugby players. But what I also enjoy is the fact that you're producing better people um, based on I guess the way that you live your life as well is that something that's that's a core philosophy for the yeah. Rugby Skills Academy? Well absolutely I think um, I always relate to these kids um, I said I, I don't just coach rugby I don't just coach skills I said I said to them if you if you don't have the respect then then I will teach you respect so um, and that's a thing like you know little things um, a kid will ask that you ask a kid to throw you to give you the ball and you throw it at you say so automatically I guess no hand me that ball please so it's one of those things that it's really giving them some some respect some mm. self-respect because I can see the way they speak to mom and dad and those sort of things they sort of you know they're really taking it for granted um, yeah. for us it's the biggest thing for us it's teaching these kids not only re the respect for is a big part of it but I said to them respecting for women it's the biggest part for us um, and, and it's a big thing. So um, I have a, a parent that I was spoken to, their, their son, I said, your kid comes across as a very difficult kid. I said, oh, if, uh, I'm sorry, but I have to, I have to teach him this. I have to have a, a hard talk to them because it's just disrupting everyone. Mm. So, you know, the mum and dad will understand that. And I said, well, if he doesn't listen, I don't want him back here because I re I'd rather have the kid who shows respect yeah. than having a kid who doesn't, you know, doesn't want to be here. So. The next day, the kid came over and apologised, and now one of the best kids that have been, been yeah, around really, the academy. That's yeah. a great turnaround. Mm. Um, so we've talked, uh, you know, in a couple of other meetings about, you know, the the one percenters and the going the extra mile, and how um, you're definitely you're when you're coaching, you're pulling kids up for getting slight technical yeah. things um, wrong or doing them, you know, mm. sort of inefficiently. So is that? And I think I get from what you said before that um, because you did the one percent as yourself to yeah. enable yourself to get to that World Cup, mm. um, you, you're focusing on that with the kids as well to make sure that they they yeah. un they understand that yes. throwing a pass yeah. and doing things completely technically correct. Yeah. Um, 
that's one of the biggest part that we teach in these kids now. I think um, you know what the program that we're rolling out. It's for them to understand. Um, I think one of the new things that I'm rolling out the kids now, uh, mainly some of the the older groups that who can comprehend that it's there's a reason why we're learning this skill because the outcome that you know. So I've always said there's a reason why we're doing this because the outcome will be that. So it's really giving them that understand. Yeah. If you do the, you know, if you are not doing this, the, the technique, the outcome will be not as good as, you know, as a positive outcome. So um, some of them, they sort of took a little while to understand, but some of them, they, they now they can understand the reason why he wanted us to do this because the outcome will be positive. Yeah. yeah. So what's next for Rugby Skills Academy? I guess you're still growing, and, and I think I expect the growth to continue for you. So what are you? How yes, you so it's 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 going. So it's going really well. Um, it's been covering a lot of Queensland. Um, we've got a massive announcement, and I guess now it's a free, you're the first one to. We're going internationally. Scoop. I like it. We're going internationally. So Auckland Rugby Academy um, are partnering up with Rugby Skills Academy. So. Former All Blacks, couple of former All Blacks, they're director of Auckland Rugby Academy. Yep. They'll be here in three months' time. Wow. Congratulations. So, yeah, yeah. So, so these guys, I'm bringing them in to, you know, into Queensland and into Rocky itself yep. um, to make sure that, you know, uh, there will be a big uh, program. So we're looking at 100 kids, um, the 15s, so it's a very top level. Yep. So these are the guys that we're going to, uh, one week sort of International Academy coming out of here. Um, what happened after that is then we'll open up 15 spots to kids to either go to New Zealand to attend the academy for two, three weeks, mm -hmm. or to go and play rugby in their season for three months next year. Wow. So that's it's a big one, change. but you know, yeah, I'm glad you changed. asked that because now you're the first one to, <laughs> to get it out there. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of responsibility. Um, yeah. So you've been qu quite good at, I guess, establishing your brand. Yeah. Um, not just in terms of representing yourself, yeah. um, but you've been able to, you know, resource sponsorship, and yeah. you, you're you, you're quite high profile on Instagram. So, how did you? Was that a conscious decision to sort of take that branding strategy to social media? Um, I, I think uh, yeah, a bit of both. I think for myself, growing up, we we sort of, we, you know, I don't like to say, but you know, we're very humble people. You know, we we don't like to talk about ourselves. So. Um, I remember way back in the days, someone said to my my wife, "Jesus, that owner is so you know very arrogant. He doesn't talk to anyone." But then the wife said, "Are you sure?" And I said, "Yeah, he doesn't talk to us." Uh, for me, if I have to go somewhere, I'll just put my head down. I'm just I don't like looking at people because I'm just that shy. I don't want people to pay attention. So coming back onto this one now, it's it's not about me. The program, it's all about, you know, the, the, the program itself. And I think that perhaps that's a difference. Um, and it's about the companies who supported the program. Um, we always have these sayings that you don't need to keep telling people how good you are. You just have to work hard. People will find out about your work. So action speaks louder, I guess. So I think that's my philosophy of always, you know, I will always be the background. I just, you know, acknowledge the companies who are, sponsor the, the program and the, and even the parents who bring you these kids because me personally that's the biggest support you know if you know if the parents don't want to bring their kids then it's not going to work um, for us it's about the brand you know the the parents and mainly the, the companies so yeah awesome mm. great mate it's been great to catch up with you thanks very much for coming in and uh, i'm hoping we'll be able to do some work together in the future yeah absolutely no thank you for having me Brilliant. thank you very much cheers Come.